So we're going to talk a bit about hypothesis testing, which is the natural extension from sampling distribution. So this all builds on what we just learned about, the idea of a sampling distribution, which remember, a sampling distribution is the distribution of a statistic for all samples of the same size from a single parent population. So remember, a sampling distribution tells us something about what we can expect in terms of a sample statistic, such as the sample mean being our focus right now, compared to, for example, some expected value given the distribution, right? We learned about central limit theorems, and we learned about the distributions of the sample mean or the sampling distribution of the mean. And learning about these things allows us to then make some connections to test values to see whether a sample statistic, such as a sample mean, is you know, not what we would expect is an extremely different value, right? And that allows us to do things like test for treatment effects, compare groups like boys to girls, and all kinds of other things. And so if you remember, we had a couple definitions. So here, one of the definitions that we talked about being really important is that there's an error in estimation of a parameter due simply to the fact that you collected a sample. So if you remember this term was sampling error, right? So sampling error, remember, tells us that we can't expect a single sample statistic to be the exact value of the population. So then we need some way to gauge, well, if a sample statistic isn't the expected value, is the difference meaningful? Is it significant? Is it unlikely to occur by chance? Or is it probably just a chance thing, right? Because we will, by chance, get differences. So we want to have some threshold to say that this difference is likely not due to chance. And we talked about the fact that one way that we can start to do this is the same kind of logic we use in a standard normal distribution, for example, by looking at, well, how many standard deviations away from the expected value is our particular statistic? And so we talked about the importance of the standard deviation of a sampling distribution, which gets its own special name, a standard error, right? That this allows us to have some kind of measure, just like the standard deviation does for scores. The standard error allows us to say, well, a statistic is, you know, however far from the expected value. And therefore, you know, if it's two standard errors away, we might say that's unlikely to be simply due to chance. And this all goes to the idea of hypothesis testing, which is the process by which we try to make decisions concerning values of parameters using statistics, right? So we can do this with an expected value for a parameter and comparing is our sample part of that population. So we're trying to make a broader inference. Um, we can also do this in comparison. So if I compare boys to girls and I have two samples, I'm trying to make an inference about boys and girls generally, not just say my two samples aren't equal. If all you want to do, say is, you know, my two samples aren't equal, all you have to do is look at the numbers and see if they're identical. But if you want to know if those differences between the samples are meaningful, are they, un are they likely to be the result of real differences in the population, right? That is a hypothesis testing process. That is um, us trying to make an inference about whether the populations differ. So we are trying to make extensions here. We don't know the parameters, but we know the sample values we get, and we can know how likely it would be to get that type of value you know, given the distributions. And so then we can make inferences about the populations without being able to measure them in their entirety directly. And so hypothesis testing really involves six steps. Now, some people shorten this, you know, you might see four steps, you might see six steps. I'm, I went on the side of more detail as opposed to less to really get across some of the statistical process. So the first thing we do in hypothesis testing is develop a research hypothesis. We call this an alternate, sometimes you hear the word alternative hypothesis. And this is basically a statement that says what you expect. So if I were going to compare boys and girls uh, and their GPAs, I might say that I expect girls to have higher GPAs than boys. See, that is a statement that is testable, right? A hypothesis must be testable. And it's a statement of an expected effect. So I wouldn't compare boys and girls if I thought there were no differences between them, because then I wouldn't even think to compare them, right? You compare because you hypothesize a difference, for example. Um, if I had people go through some kind of special financial planning course, I might compare them to an expected value for the amount of debt that they would have, right? And say, well, here's what the debt for their age group usually would be. I expect that they will have less debt because they took this financial planning course. That would be an alternate hypothesis. The alternate hypothesis always contains a statement of difference, of inequality, right? I think that my people who went through the program will have less debt inequality, right? I think girls will have higher GPAs than boys inequality. The null hypothesis, there's always a corresponding null, and null simply means to nullify, right? To get rid of. So what that tells us is whatever the effect is that you have hypothesized in the alternate, the null just says nah, right? So it's not the opposite, it's just nullification. So if I say girls have higher GPAs than boys. The null does not say boys have higher than girls. It simply says there is no difference between boy and girl GPAs, right? If I say that my program is going to make people have less debt, the null does not say it'll make them have more. It simply says it will have no effect on the amount of debt they experience. So the null is the absence of relationship. It is a statement of equality, right? Things will be the same. So once you have stated your alternate hypothesis, you construct a corresponding null. Now, once you've done that, the process that happens, albeit in the background here, is that you have to have a sampling distribution under the null hypothesis. So you would say, okay, given the null is true, what is it I expect to occur? And this is a, this is the nice part where we can get into some of the inferential process because we know what to expect under the null. It's a statement of equality. So the mean of that distribution will have to be zero, right? No difference, for example. And then we can estimate the standard error for that distribution using values like the standard deviation from our samples and sample sizes used to obtain them and things like that. So even if you don't have the values given, like in the z-test, there are still ways to get at this that are very effective. 
So you have this idea of, well, what is the sampling distribution going to look like under the null, which is a nice kind of implied truth, right? No difference. You collect data. So you get your sample data and you say, okay, well, I expect, you know, no difference. What is it that I observe? Is there a difference? And then is that difference significant is the thing I want to determine, which requires me to compare the statistic from my data to the expected value in the distribution under the null, right? So once I do that, then I had come to a point where I have to decide, do I reject or retain the null hypothesis? So this can sound kind of backwards and outside of the context of intro stats, people don't tend to use these words. So rejecting the null, right? Reject means get rid of. Null means no difference. So a hypothesis is an idea, right? So reject the idea that there is no difference. Retain means to keep. So keep the idea that there is no difference. All right. So if I hypothesize that there's an effect and I find an effect, then I reject the null, right? I got rid of the idea there was no difference because the evidence indicates there is likely a difference, right? So reject the null, we often say instead the phrase statistically significant. That means that what we've observed is unlikely to happen by chance, assuming the null is true. So the phrase statistically significant is typically used in lieu of reject the null hypothesis. We would say the effect was statistically significant. In lieu of retain, we would say the effect was not statistically significant, which means that we can't conclude from our data that it is unlikely that the statistic we obtained um, does, you know, does not belong to the null. So it probably, you know, it could live in the null distribution, so we can't conclude otherwise. So what are we really testing? I think this is important to understand. We can not, with these classical methods, test directly the truth of the hypotheses. You are not proving the null. You are not proving the alternate, okay? So you can't say, oh, look, I proved my hypothesis. That is actually incorrect. So we are not testing what is the probability of the null hypothesis given the data. That is not what our math is allowing us to test. We are also not testing what is the probability of the alternate hypothesis given the data. Rather, what we are testing is what is the probability of obtaining the data we have obtained, assuming the null is true, that is given the null. So what's the probability of seeing what we saw if the null were true? So the null is the assumption. It is where we always start. And in fact, this is how science and, and really rational decision-making systems work. The, the baseline position you should take is a position of skepticism, right? A skeptic has no burden of proof. There's no claim being made. Um, and so the idea here is that the null just says nothing going on. There's no special claim there. And so it's a position of skepticism. And so if someone comes along and says, oh, I can cure cancer, the baseline position you should take is skepticism, right? You shouldn't just, oh, yeah, I believe you. You should assume that they can't cure cancer until what? Until they can produce data to support, right? And so how does the data support their hypothesis? Well, the data supports their hypothesis by not fitting in to the world in which the null is true, right? So this is the process we really use. What is the probability I would observe what I have if the null were true? And so if you think about it, like the rational legal system it works this way too. I mean, science always works this way. Science, you know, you don't just believe a claim because a claim is made. You have to get evidence to support, right? So you don't move from a position of disbelief or unbelief without evidence, right? The baseline position is unbelief. And then you move from that only when evidence is provided to suggest that unbelief is not an appropriate response, given the data, given the evidence that has been observed, right? And that's how it works in science. We don't believe someone's claim in science until evidence supports their claim, right? And the claims are a dime a dozen, but claims that have evidence for them make a difference. And so that's what we're doing. We're saying, what's the probability of getting this data if I assume your, your claim is not true, right? What's the probability I would have seen 100 people, you know, have remission rates at 82% if your drug did not affect cancer, right? Oh, you know, well, what is the normal remission rate? Maybe it's 13%, right, for example. So what's the probability I get 82% remission? We're under the null, I'd expect only 13. And that probability is probably very low. So then I go, hmm, this drug probably makes a difference for cancer, right, evidence. So sometimes this can seem kind of backwards, but it's not really that backwards. Uh, you think about the legal system, and it works the same way. So in the legal system, we have to assume that people are innocent until proven guilty in a rational legal system. So this is another case where humans realized that evidence is required for beliefs to be made. So the, the, the null position is that like someone is in just a normal law-abiding citizen. I wouldn't want to believe otherwise about you without evidence to suggest that you're not a law-abiding citizen, right? So these kinds of claims require evidence. So if you think about your, you know, innocent until proven guilty, that is a similar concept. Innocence is the null hypothesis, and we assume the null until evidence is provided 
that indicates that that is an unreasonable position to hold. And therefore, I am going to conclude that you're probably guilty, right? So this is an important kind of thing to understand in terms of how we make decisions.